Okay, it's seven o'clock. We'll uh, call a regular meeting of the Buchanan, Buchanan City Council to order. Ask if you join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. We'll respect the flag. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item of business is the Elizabeth J. Poundstone Memorial Scholarship. Jared, will you join me up here, please? Tim, you can come up too. I think you should. Best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> I get to share in this too? I yeah, sure do. I'm going to read this Mayor's Proclamation, which is a tradition here. Whereas Elizabeth J. Binky Poundstone served the city of Buchanan for 37 years in several capacities, including as a member of city council long-time recorder and treasurer and mayor, and whereas Mrs. Poundstone died while serving as our city's mayor on September 7, 2000, leaving a rich and selfless legacy of devoted public service to our city and further to the youth of our Buchanan Upshur community, and whereas Mrs. Poundstone's family in 2008 proposed to the city council that a family-funded scholarship be established with $500 to be awarded in August of each year in memory of Mrs. Poundstone to a deserving student seeking to attend college or whose parent or other guardian or family member is or had been an employee of the city of Buchanan or which employee in their own right is seeking to further their own education through college attendance. And whereas the city council considered and approved the Poundstone Family Scholarship proposal during its regularly convened meeting of July 3rd, 2008, agreeing to the city's participation in the annual scholarship application review and selection process. And whereas as a, as a consequence of that process that included the review and selection committee's consideration of several very well qualified applicants, the committee has determined that the seventh recipient of the annual Elizabeth J. Binky Poundstone Memorial Scholarship shall be Jared Brock of Buchanan being the son of dedicated city employee and sanitary supervisor Tim Rock. And whereas the Poundstone family and the entire city of Buchanan family desire to recognize Jared Rock and wish him the very best of luck as he continues his studies this fall toward a Doctor of Pharmacy degree at Western University. Now therefore I, Kenneth T. Davidson, Mayor of the City of Buchanan, pursuant to the power and authority duly vested in me, do hereby proclaim the seventh recipient of the annual Elizabeth J. Binky Poundstone Memorial Scholarship to be Jared Rock. Mr. Rock further shall be recognized in perpetuity as the recipient of this prestigious award through the inscription of his name upon a placard to be displayed in the main foyer of Buchanan City Hall along with all past and future Poundstone Memorial Scholarships given under my hand and official seal of the City of Buchanan 7th day of August 2014. Jared, congratulations. Got that? Yep. I'm working on it. And uh, something you can use more than the plaque maybe is a little check. <laughs> and Tim, <laughs> Thanks, congratulations. Thank you. Thank I know you. this family have known these boys since they were, it's got their triplets, you know, and uh, uh, known them since they were in the cradle. And uh, it's good to have you here. And I'm, I'm glad that we were able to do this for you through, through Binky's uh, competition, family fun competition. Thank you. I'd also like to take this opportunity for a run clear out breath. <laughs> the another mayor's proclamation, y'all are, are aware that uh, Dorothy Short is uh, not doing well and we choose to recognize her service to the city as well as her husband Bill Shore who served for many years this proclamation whereas Dorothy Dutton Short 
has served our city by Buchanan in several positions for a period spanning nearly 40 years, including as a member of city council from 87 to 89, the water board 1992 and 2005 through 2014, the zoning board of appeals from 78 to 89 and 96 through 2014, and the planning commission from 1976 to 1983 as well as being the former, former First Lady of Buchanan from 1977 through 1985 during her husband Bill Short's eight years as mayor. And whereas the city of Buchanan on September 23, 2005 then dedicated its renovated pavilion at City Hall, City Park in honor of William R. Bill Short. And whereas the city council believes that the renaming of Bill Short Pavilion at City Park to the Bill and Dorothy Short Pavilion will be a most fitting tribute to honor the extensive service of both our longtime Mayor Bill Short and his wife Dorothy for their combined 82 years of service to our city organization. And whereas our city further will formally recognize and honor Dorothy Short during the festivities to be conducted to, during Buchanan's Festival Friday, on Friday, August 8, 2014, and celebrate her decades of service to our city. Now, therefore, I, Kenneth T. Davidson, Mayor of the City of Buchanan, pursuant to the power and authority duly invested in me to hereby proclaim Friday, August 8, 2014, to be Dorothy Short Day throughout Buchanan, West Virginia. I further direct that a permanent sign be erected at Buchanan City Park in front of the primary pavilion, there forever designating the pavilion as the Bill and Dorothy Short Pavilion. I urge all citizens of our Bank of Cannon Upshur community to pause and reflect upon the decades of service of Dorothy Short and to join the members of our city family and our friends and fellow community members during a special dedication to be held at approximately 6 p.m. in our city's Jawbone Park during Festival Friday on August 8, 2014. We'll uh, pass that along. Very fitting. Mm -hmm. Very fitting. Okay, next on the agenda, Laura Meadows, Upshur County Convention Visitors Bureau. Laura? I have some updated handouts because I know you have information in your packet, but I added stuff, so. Okay, you're a stuff adder, are you? That's right, that's right. <laughs> I'm surprised she's doing this paper. <laughs> yeah. It's not Christmas yet. <laughs> okay, so this is the Upshur County Convention Visitors Bureau for um, this school year 2013 to 2014. So what I've done and passed out is just a review of what we've accomplished in the past year. I'll give a few highlights of what we're looking forward to next year um, and take any questions. So just right off the bat, last year we were able to obtain $15,000 in advertising grant money from the Division of Tourism. Um, that program's changed a lot in the past few years. The funds are dwindling. So for probably three to six months, it was completely depleted and they didn't have the fund available anymore. Um, just about a month ago, we got an email and they have revitalized the program. It's been cut even more. So for this current year, we'll probably expect $7,500, but we can still get some advertising grant money, so we'll take it when we can get it. We have um, three major marketing campaigns, and you can kind of see some examples. Our major marketing campaign is called What Small Town Charm is All About, and we've done that from the first day that we started advertising by Canon, basically. And we talked to a lot of people, and we said, you know, if you could sum up by Canon in three words, what would you say? And it came down to small town, charming atmosphere, so we put small town charm together, and it's worked really well since then. This past year, we were able to start a new advertising cam campaign that's called Stay the Weekend. And you can see an example of that advertisement to the um, right side of the page. And it's really effective for us because we can place one ad and cover five or six major events that happen in our community. And really, whenever you think of people and what they're traveling for, they want to have an event. I mean, a lot of people are looking for events, and they can come for the afternoon enjoy the event and then travel in the region for the rest of the weekend so it's been really good for us and it gives it shares advertising dollars with a lot of different people we have also in the past year started our 33 things to do on route 33 campaign that's where we partnered with the lewis county cbb and the randolph county cbb and we're highlighting 33 attractions along our roadway and as soon as we 
finalized that program and the advertising campaign, we found out that Route 33 is going to change to US 48 eventually. So we'll do a plus 15 advertising campaign when that happens. So <laughs> we're prepared for it at least. We also did a regional golf advertising campaign. It partnered um, between Mon County, Marion, Harrison, Lewis, and Upshur. And each county was able to list which golf courses they had, and we packaged them all together and encouraged people to be in the region and try all these different golf courses. So it was really nice to spread our money around and work with some other CBBs. We also have continued our internal advertising grant program, and that's basically where local businesses and organizations in Upshur County can come to the CBB and request up to $750 to advertise their event, their business, um, whatever they're doing. So you can see the different people that we advertised and we, we granted awards to and a total of $4,600 were distributed last year and we continue to offer that program next year too. So it's generally about the same amount, it's about $4,600 each year that we can give out to different organizations. <coughs> we are extremely active on social media sites, so every single day on Facebook we're trying to do something and it's just been a <coughs> huge effective tool. We have over a thousand likes on our Facebook page right now. A lot of people are Buckingham natives who are not here anymore, so they want to kind of keep up to date of what's happening in Buckingham, so we really appreciate it. We also have a Twitter account. Um, we do have a few different stats. We were able to distribute 18,188 Upshur County travel guides, and each travel guide is 29 pages long, so it lists just about a little bit of everything that you can do in Upshur County, so it's a really good piece for us. The travel guide, we've we just ordered our sixth edition of the travel guide. Each time we order the travel guides, we order 10,000. So this means we're on to 60,000 travel guides to distribute since we started um, three years ago. And that is a 7% increase from last year. We are able to be represented at travel shows. What we do is we pay a fee and a state organization will take our travel guide to different travel shows and they distribute the Upshur County travel guide in the different places like Ohio, DC, Pittsburgh, Florida, Boston. So that's been a really good opportunity for us. Our website is extremely active. We've had 19,242 visits and again that's a 7% increase from last year. And it's really also interesting to note that people are spending on average about two minutes on our website. So in two minutes they're able to look at lodging facilities, places to eat, places to shop, and all the events that are happening in town too. Every single year we're kind of changing our advertising creative design aspect so we kind of tweaked our image every single year and we did a website redesign this past year and it looks absolutely wonderful it's the the bottom left advertisement if you see on the bottom it kind of has this natural burlap brown texture to it so we've changed everything to be a little bit more natural and it looks real nice we were we came in number three as America's coolest small town. It was a really good race. Um, we had everybody in Buchanan, I think, voting every single day. I think we burned people out because every single day we were sending email blasts. And it was, it, we tried really hard, but number three is still a really good um, placement for us. And we actually have had people who, as they're traveling, they want to stop and see what was so cool about Buchanan. They saw our name on the list and they made a destination of Buchanan to come in and check it out. We actively have cash mob promotions where basically once a month we pick, well, not just the CBB, it's a partnership between the Chamber and Creek by Cannon and the Development Authority, but we pick a local business and we cash mob them and we try to encourage the entire community to go out and spend $25 at one location. So if you have 50 people spending $25 at one business one day, it can be a huge impact. So every single month we're trying something different this coming month in August it's going to be with Highland Nurseries so it's it's been fun it's something free for local businesses and it's been pretty successful we utilize Wesleyan as a really good partnership their marketing research class always does a study for us and um, we have a service scholar who is at our site every single semester and it, they're just a wonderful resource for the CVB in any part of Buchanan we are still an accredited CBB. Whenever we got our accreditation two years, that um, would last for three years. So in about a year, we'll apply for re-accreditation, but we've been able to maintain accreditation for the past two years. 
and you can see that we've placed probably over 20 direct advertisements and I've listed a few of the different medias with budget travel, West Virginia Living, um, Guest Quest, Civil War Traveler. So we try to spread out our advertising dollars really well. <coughs> On the next page you can see just some few highlights that are coming up for next year. Um, again, 33 Things to Do has been a really good campaign with, for us and since a lot of our advertising grant dollars are being diminished at the state level, we're trying to find different ways to make our advertising money stretch. So partnering advertising dollars with two other CBBs have been a, a huge plus for us. So this is just a little screenshot of what our website for the 33 Things to Do campaign looks like. It's called getawaytowestvirginia.com. So we do have a specific website just for that campaign. We just got rack cards in probably two months ago we got 20,000 rap cards in for this campaign and I have two boxes left so we have less than 2,000 left to distribute so 18,000 went out the door like that. Um, we do have specific online direct ads just for this campaign so it's completely separate than everything else that we do just for Buckhannon. We're continuing to partner in the 2015 West Virginia Travel Guide and we're, we have joint social media presence for this campaign and um, the Division of Tourism is starting to pick up on these regional partnerships and highlight those too. So we'll get a little bit more feedback from the state. And of course the big thing is we're getting ready to launch the event center at Freshy Fork. We have confirmed with um, some people at the state level that we can hold a ribbon cutting ceremony on October 1st, 2014. It's going to be from 1 to 3 p.m. And we're actually going to be able to partner with the National Guard and have a big ribbon cutting ceremony for the National Guard aspect of it, along with the event center. Um, our first booked event is eight, October 18th, and it sounds like we've got some time, but we really don't. So we're trying to get everything put together, and it's coming together wonderfully. It's been amazing. We were actually out at the facility on Wednesday, and the carpet is down in the um, conference center side of things. It looks absolutely amazing. Um, every single day we continue to get phone calls. We've got some more booked, penciled in events. We don't want to say booked because we still have some details to finalize, but a lot of penciled in events for 2015. And the good thing is a lot of the things that we're booking right now, they're going to be repeat <coughs> events. So they're going to continue to come back to Buckhannon. So they, if they're going to have a great experience. They're going to come back and it's just going to grow from there. Um, if we have banquet style seating, it looks like our capacity is going to be around 420 people. So if you have round tables filling the entire conference center, it's 420 seats. Um, and that's the, the room completely <coughs> full of tables. So of course, if you're starting to add, just add a stage or a dance floor or buffet lines, it's going to eat into that, but it's a good number. And we're soon going to launch a website specifically for the event center. We're going to have specific literature just for the event center. And then we will have an advertising campaign that will kick off this fall, springish. Do you have fees? We don't. We're working on it. We're getting to a really good point with the National Guard and establishing this. I can put a lot of, a lot of wedding receptions for the activity. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. Are there any other Especially questions? Especially with the alcohol. Can you say what your first event's going to be? Yeah, it's Wesleyan's Homecoming. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, can you speak a little bit about the Main Street Arts Festival that's coming up in September? Yeah. Um, Main Street Arts Festival, I think this will be the fourth or fifth year. I can't quite remember which year we're in right now. It's hosted by the Main Street Arts Cooperative. And what we do is try to get, last year, the past couple of years, we've had 25 to 30 artists. So that's our goal again for this year. Um, 25, 30 artists that set up in Jawbone. And, you know, we encourage people to come down and meet the artists, have an opportunity to buy their work. We try to get some live demos happening during that event. Um, we even partner at the same time the farmer's market is happening. So we try to partner with the farmer's market and make sure things happen. Um, work in cooperation with them. We have children's activities that'll happen, like different arts and crafts projects, and a little bit of live music that day, too. Yeah, thank you. Does it interfere, with, is there anything else going on downtown at that time or at the college on that particular day? That weekend is Parents Weekend with Wesleyan, which we're able to do an insert, and Wesleyan's gonna do a direct mailing and let all the parents know of everything that's happening Good. in Buchanan, so that's gonna be a feature, the arts festival. So whenever they send it out, I think they're sending out 1,400 letters. 
So 1,400 people will get to hear about the arts festival. And then the children's festival at Stalker. It is a really busy weekend. It gets really crazy. So hopefully people from the children's festival come over to Jawbone. People from Jawbone go over to the children's festival with their families. Now, do you set up for the Bobcat Fair? I do. Okay. Yeah, we usually, usually the chamber and the visitor center will partner together and just have one booth. Laura, mm -hmm. what, um, back, I don't know, a few months ago, I went to, um, to the Capitol and there was the, um, Elkins Chamber of Commerce and visitors people were there and I forget what the event was for but do we do that? Do if it's what I'm thinking you can actually declare um, a county day at the Capitol. That's what it was. Yeah. That's they what have it was. a Randolph County Day yeah. at the Capitol. I have a note I contacted um, Del Delegate Hamilton about doing an Upshur County okay. Day and I have a note on my calendar because I called him and he said wait until I think maybe October or November to get in touch with me but I have a note Somebody else might have to handle that in October and November, but I've got a note to follow up on that so we can have an extra count. And that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. But but I like the way too that the um, your organization partners with Lewis County and mm -hmm. Randolph County uh, and sharing your ideas and your efforts. And it's everything. nice because people. It, it's nice that the other CDBs recognize and everybody recognizes that there's not a county line to a tourist. Exactly. They don't care. Exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Any other questions for Laura? Laura, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Department Board Reports, Michael. Yeah. Before I get started, Tom O'Neill wants to, to join us. Okay. The conference call. Someone's on the Oregon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Sorry. Wait, here. No, wait. I'm a lock. Don't. All right. We're on lock. You have a line. Oh, wait. Oh, but she said we'd never let anything come between us. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> Sooner or later, we're not out. It's great you all shared a muscle. <laughs> yeah, we're happy for you. <laughs> hey, Laura, are you staying? Yes, I am. Oh, good girl. Well, I figured we have other stuff. Oh, we got a lot of that on the wall. Really want excitement, Laura? Come next week. What are you doing? Are you calling? Yeah. Hello. Speaker. You have reached the voice mail box. We'll call him back later. <laughs> okay. He can. That's my report. My report is actually very short tonight. Uh, I will have something to talk to you all about when we go into executive session. But I did want to put in front of you our, our end of month uh, fiscal year 14, 15 July report. Uh, just to let you know that for the month of July so far here to date, uh, we've received uh, approximately $336,717.49 in revenue. Uh, we've expended approximately $300,316.35, which is a little bit of an excess uh, revenue over expenditures of $36,401.14. Um, again, with this report, it's always a summary. If you all want any detailed reports, I'll be happy to provide those to you. I do want to make a note that, that is in your financial report that the sanitary board has paid uh, 25000 to the general fund, uh, 25000 of the total 100000 loan that was uh, requested uh, in contribution by the general fund uh, for the emergency work done at the college and the Brook Street uh, pump station, leaving their balance to general fund of $75,000. Uh, with this payment of $25,000, uh, they have actually exceeded their annual debt payment obligation by 5000 If you recall, they borrowed 100000 for five years of 20000 So um, there's basically four four years remaining on the debt. We can get a payment of uh, you know, 20000 So just to let you know, they have paid the 25, they have paid 25000 of their debt, so they're getting that down. The only other thing I have that, that I won't talk about, that I'll talk about in an executive session, is just under old business. I do want to remind you all that our home rule uh, meeting with the Municipal Home Rule Board, their regional meeting is again going to be held in Bridgeport at Bridgeport City Hall 
Uh, this will be Monday, August the 25th at 8.30. Guess what time our presentation starts? 8.30. So we'll be there bright and early at 8.30 to give our presentation. Um, I understand there's, there's 39 home rule board members. So we'll be in front of potentially 39 people. So that sounds like that'll be fun. Um, I do want to also note that the city of Auburn, St. Albans was disqualified earlier this week. So actually that now leaves 22 municipalities vying for 16 spots. So our odds got better. Um, other than that, I, I don't have anything else to report at this time. I wanted to make it short and sweet. Um, and I'll next, my next comments will be under an executive session. Question. Fines and fees. Revenue summary. Uh, cons please. This consists of citations that we receive, court costs, fines and municipal court. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have any figures that show how much uh, uh, parking ticket fines? That's, it, it's in consolidated, but I, I can get those figures for you. Could you get that, sure. please? Sure. And, and also, um, what the collections are for the for the meters in town? Okay, so you want meter collection of meter collection, and parking, especially in the parking in, in the number one parking lot. Okay. Okay, I can get that for you. And, and do you have it broke down as to fines written in number one parking lot? Um, I, yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. I can get it for you. I can have it broke down. Thank you. It take a little while. So you want lot one yeah. fines collected, mm -hmm. and then you want overall fines collected or revenue from meters? Revenue from meters in lot one and overall throughout the city. Okay, revenue of meters. Okay, Ron, I'll try to have that for you uh, I'm soon, good. or if not, before the next council. That would be great. Thank okay. you, mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, I just want to ask, um, how would one be disqualified from the home room? They, uh, it was uh, a technicality. <coughs> Essentially what the paper was reporting is that they needed to have two public hearings. We only had to have one. So what I'm assuming is their second reading of their ordinance uh, happened after the application deadline. I think the paper only got it messed up down in Charleston. Um, but it was a technicality, so that the Home Rule Board um, disqualified. We haven't got a letter so far, so we're good. So, so we're still in. So we're still in. Any other questions from Michael? Did you have one? No. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Jay Hall, City Engineer. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief, as I always state, but sometimes I can get a little long-winded on certain subjects. Uh, the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant Program regarding the generators. I called the uh, project manager slash administrator for that project yesterday, and he's out of the office, and we'll be returning calls. And again, just for the people that are out there listening and not unaware of what this project is, it's for the backup emergency generators for the uh, water department at the Tenderton Booster Station and some renovations and electrical rewiring at the raw water intake. Uh, the water treatment plant improvement project work still continues on the preliminary engineering design. They're approximately 45% complete. Uh, Chapman Technical Group attended last month's water board meeting and gave the water board an update and they're continuing on with uh, that project. The water storage cleaning and inspection uh, project has been completed. I received the reports uh, from the inspections this afternoon, currently reviewing them, and a representative from a utility service group will attend next week's water board meeting to present those findings and facts and go over the uh, reports in more detail for the six water storage tanks. Uh, public safety complex, as I reported last month, that they're up and running, the police department is in, so far, I've heard lots of good things and just a few minor things that need some tweaking via a punch list. Um, the only two major items are, are outside work, the completion of the uh, ramp and the exterior um, driving system. I would invite you all to go down and have a look at it if you haven't been through it. It's, it's nice and, and there's something to be proud of, both the police department and the street department. You have a question? I have a question about parking. Are we going to the line parking in that particular lot over there I would assume you know something needs to be done because the, the striping is you know barely visible and it was you know laid out when there was only there one go ahead so they're going to stripe it after they finish Main Street uh, at the, okay good because it, it's just been a 
parking of the cruisers over there looks like ants on a breadcrumb. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be nice if we parked everything, you know, employee parking here, cruisers in the next row, have some type of and consistency and order to it. And then the center part is open to the general yeah, public. That would, I agree that, with would, you. that would also alleviate a bit of our parking problem. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Um, some of you will be excited, maybe not the timing on this one, but we finally have some movement on the uh, McDonald's Route 20 lane widening project. The uh, memorandum of agreement between the West Virginia Department of Highways and um, Federal Highways Administration has finally been approved and the DOH now has the necessary clearances in regards to the environmental issues uh, on that particular project. Uh, they've been cleared and they've actually started proceeding with the right-of-way acquisition and the utility relocation plans. Here comes the part that we're, we, we need to fine-tune a little bit. They anticipate uh, advertising, bidding, and awarding of the project in January, <coughs> starting of the project in February, and wrapping it up you know, no later than the end of September. Uh, the mayor and I, are, I made the mayor aware of this this morning, and, and we're going to make some phone calls and inquiries and, and uh, see if there's some room for adjustment in there, because we all know what happens uh, in May. <laughs> and the school's still in session and it's snowing and so but we're going to be working on that but things are moving forward if they have a computer project on top i hope so like very seldom let's see a late start like after may <laughs> but you know I'm, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth if they're going to do it I, i'd like to see it done jay is that is is the part of highways doing their contracting that out so uh, i think they're going to be contracting it out at least the utility parts i know they will be contracting out but we'll just, I'll advise you as I get updates on a monthly basis and, and keep you uh, in the loop of what's going on there. Um, I this is the one that I, I don't like because Dave and I have been working on this uh, extensively over the past month. I reported to you that Lumos has approached, had to have approached the city about installing some fiber optic cabling in the uh, Trader's Alley, which is behind uh, Jawbone Park. Um, I took that good news to them that you all had approved, you know, uh, pending. The mayor's and I's final discussion because all the engineering had been reviewed and uh, they were going to put it underground and on one side and they were going to have the property surveyed so that they made sure that they were on a certain tract of property and not another one. I reported that to them the following Monday in July and then of course they wanted to change it. <laughs> so things have changed since we last talked or since I last presented this information to you. They were wanting to go overhead as late as last week and then i believe dave and i have gotten some correspondence and now it's almost back to the original design of being underground on the opposite side of the alley so it's just kind of being tossed up in the air right now and i don't know where we are uh, we're going to have a meeting as soon as jerry arnold comes back from uh, his vacation i believe that's uh, august 18th and set up a meeting with lumos and try to iron this out once and for all <coughs> Uh, Gateway East Enhancement Project, that project started last July 7th. Uh, they're currently, the street crews are currently up to Factory Street with the demolition uh, portion of the project. And they're approximately 825 feet from the College Avenue intersection with the placement of the concrete. They're working steadily up this way, uh, making uh, a lot of progress. I think it's going uh, it's more smooth than it did last year. Um, basically because we, we've got the routine down, we know what to expect as far as traffic patterns, we've got the streets closed off, we know how much we can do in a particular day, and I just think that it's going a, a lot smoother this year. Um, I attached a memo to your all's report last month since I wasn't going to, I mean the last council meeting since I wasn't here, but Mr. O'Neill requested some information about the LED lighting conversion, and I can go over that if you all don't have any questions, but you know that information is is, it was in your all's packets and, and I brought it with me in case you all have any questions. We also assisted Mountaineer Gas in the relocation of about 425 feet of uh, gas line from 1903 that was under a portion of the sidewalk that we were replacing and they had to get it out of the way before we could move in there. But for something to hold up for 111 years, I thought that was pretty good because it's actually stamped on the gas line, 1903. So uh, that was interesting. A little bit of fact out there. <laughs> um, this is a new project, uh, Quarter H South uh, Utility Project. Uh, there's a stakeholders meeting scheduled for August 20 with, with the City of Buckhannon Utilities, Tim, Sam, I, the Mayor, Michael, uh, and the property owners along Quarter H that have some property between Fink's Run, which is where Smitty Suzuki is, 
and Hampton Inn, you know, looking for potential development and, and supplying of utilities. We have a meeting scheduled for, for August 20th. Uh, I'll let you know what comes of that. Uh, it's kind of, they, the, the, the property owners are requesting some uh, action a little sooner rather than later, but uh, we, we haven't programmed for that in, in this particular year, but we'll see what happens from that stakeholders meeting. Last but not least is the um, Army Corps of Engineer Local Flood Protection Project. Some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not, but in 1969 and 1970, the Army Corps of Engineers started the bridge over on the island and uh, cleared four and a half miles of stream banks, both left and right. And the reason that was, was one, to uh, allow the passage of floodwaters through more quickly and to increase the storage capacity of the Buchanan River. A quick analogy is a bathtub. A bathtub only holds so much water, and it's supposed to remain that way. But as soon as you throw some toys in it and some kids and they start splashing around, water goes everywhere because it's not designed to hold all that volume. Well, that's what's happened over the last 44 years. Is that kids in the water? Yeah. No, 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 we don't have any of that. We have woody vegetation. The, the trees and the shrubs and the overgrowth has really grown up. And uh, it's, gotten to the, it's gotten to the point that we, have, we were getting good and fair evaluations. The last report that came in was minimally acceptable. The only step below this is unacceptable. And they had indicated that the next visit, which is due uh, May of next year, will be more than likely, if no action or any progress has been shown, it will be con you know, considered unacceptable. I inquired to the project manager for that with the core as to what that means he's going to give me more detailed information but the quick and dirty of it this afternoon was we could be ineligible for federal assistance due to flooding events that would happen along that section of the river now it doesn't affect a lot of buckhannon because the city limits stop but it could affect people in usher county and uh, the city of buckhannon so you know some of the highlights uh, in the report or remove all woody vegetation, vegetation according to the maintenance manual provided to the city in October 1970. Remove debris and shoaling, which are sandbars and sandbanks in the channel. And continue to monitor the stream banks for signs of erosion or the diversion channel, and that's the one right out here. That's actually the diversion channel that wraps up around North Buchanan and wraps back down. Got to keep that clean of debris and vegetation. So we've got a little bit of work cut out for us. Um, I mentioned this to Michael a couple times. We have contacted the Army National Guard to see if uh, they would be interested in offering some services and their assistance you know, during this cleanup. Uh, the person tasked with uh, coordinating that with us is on vacation this week. And uh, we'll get together next week and we're going to talk to him uh, Tuesday during our DEP dam inspection, which went well, completely other project, but I'm not going to report on that today. And uh, he said we can talk about that next week. But uh, the project manager for the Army Corps engineer did indicate strongly on the telephone that we, we need to come up with a plan of, of some action to make remediations on this repair. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that, that uh, it's, it's on the radar and we'll need to do something. Well, this, this is just within the city of it? No. It How goes far? down to the bridge past Warehouser. Past Warehouser. Before you get to the railroad overpass, but okay, to the but bridge. It, it doesn't go up river. No. It starts at the bridge right out here on the island. Okay. Starts and goes, it goes yeah. uh, 4.42 miles. Because I know up, up river they, they don't want to do anything they say because of the fishing. The hatchery and the, the musky fish, the, the bass fish. fishing yeah. and the. Yeah, this is completely different. This is for after it goes back. Yeah. This is for, you know, and again, it's to provide a clean and clear channel for the water to pass through as quickly as possible. And right now there's obstructions. And uh, it's not a short-term fix by any means. Nine miles of tree line and vegetation is not going to be fixed in three to five years. But I think it's something that we'll need to consider as a council and, you know, boards that we need to uh, well, we're going stay to on top of this. Action plan and... Yep, show some progress. Yes. And Jay, you're saying if it's if it's unacceptable, then the city residents lose eligibility for no, flood relief. The way that it's explained, that it was explained in the email, and Michael even said the thing it was a little cloudy. You know, he says one thing in one sentence and says another one, but the way I read it in the manual uh, that was provided and their latest uh, requirements and regulations was that we would be could be 
ineligible for federal assistance after a flooding event. You know, if something was damaged, if, uh, you know, well, it's not going to be the dams washed out. Well, it could be the dams washed out, some boat ramps are destroyed, maybe, you know, different things associated with the flood that we could be ineligible for rehabilitation improvement funds, you know, to restore it back to its, you know, condition. Uh, our, when we, you know, signed this agreement to take this project on, it's actually started in 1962. It's some interesting reading today. Uh, the forefathers agreed to do certain things, and one of those was maintain the, the banks free and clear. And that, that's the big one. And um, I'm not here to, to say what's right, what's wrong, but um, it's something that we need to address because we are a CRS community, you know, net, recognized by the National Flood Insurance Program. We get discounted rates to our, you know, citizens that are in the floodplain and, you know, near the floodway. And uh, we're at a class eight, trying to get to a class seven. We're, we're, we're almost there, and that's gonna provide an additional 5% of insurance discounts. But, uh, you know, they hang in that carrot. It's not a carrot, but it's not something that, that, they're holding that over our heads that, you know, you could lose or be ineligible for, you know, rehabilitation funds. Okay, I thought several years ago they were cleaning out some trees. 44-year-old trees. <laughs> trees that were falling out of the river. The street department worked on Well, the street day. department has pulled a tree or two yeah. from time to time. But the... Uh, uh, this is way beyond... So when you you start reading those regulations and it gets really convoluted. And uh, the, uh, you know, we could uh, cut a tree on the, on the bank of the river and take it out, or we could cut it into the river and drag it out, but if it naturally falls into the river, right. you got to get a permit from the Corps engineers to take it out. Yeah, and their <laughs> right. And then, but their argument is that you know that tree should have never been there. You know, and that's what they're saying. And it's not all the trees; it's only to a certain level, the ordinary high water mark of the river that's been established. We don't have to take all the trees off the river bank, but where the at the time, I don't know if the '85 flood supersedes the 1918 flood as far as water elevation, but whatever the water elevation is at the highest flood on record that's where the trees have to be removed to so uh, you know that's that's something we've got to face it's a long task you know i expect it to be going on in 10 and 15 years but you know my first thoughts start at the north buchanan park and start working your way down you know to get that water out here as, as quickly as possible no need to start on the other end <laughs> how long is that watershed project down pex run and all that stuff been going on well, it, yeah, I don't, long, I don't yeah. know, but it's, it's been longer, yeah. maybe, but... Uh, yeah. Is this basically but, the same Well, I, it's a little different because Fed's put some some money into the uh, maintenance of PEC front. Yeah. I know I commissioner, yeah. you know, yeah. you would have, once a year, we had to go walk it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is done every two years. Yeah. It's a biannual uh, inspection. If, if we show that we're working on it, I, Oh, I, so I think probably that's going to yes, show, uh, but but I would like to but see. We really do have to make some physical activity on it. Too. Yes, I think you know a plan. You know, plan. may not cut it. You know, it's the first step. But they yeah. want to. See, you know, he indicated to me when I met with him that he wants to see some vegetation removal. Define some. You know, I don't want it to be one or two trees. <laughs> you know, but they want to see some movement. And like the mayor indicated, we have to have a plan this much money each year for the next X years, how much can we move? Because it's four and a half miles on both sides. That's that's a lot of trees. Do the trees have to come up by the root or not? Be, the, the root balls have to be taken out. Really? Because they'll destabilize the bank as they decay and erode. Actually, I, I saw on the, somebody put a thing on Facebook yesterday, this huge machine came through and just leveled trees off and oh, yeah. chewed them up like yeah. crazy. Well, you got a machine that is seventeen trillion dollars. Oh, in, in the past, you know, uh, and this program has changed. You know, we used uh, the work release program to assist in that. Uh, we've got some of our own street department gentlemen. We've hired some summer help, but uh, it, it's going to require a little more attention. Yeah. And I just wanted to bring that up to you. Because Mike and I have some work to it's do. It's a lot easier to do it when the water's down. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah. The. Uh, now, how, explain to me again where this starts, Jay. Right at the mill race. Right, right at the mill works. Right, 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 right at the okay. bridge mill where uh, Fort Smitty Suzuki used to be. Okay. okay. You know, just in front of the dam. Right in front of the dam. And then it's the okay. 4.4 is the center line of the river as it meanders. 
Right, and it's to the, it really is to the bridge past Weyerhaeuser, but before the railroad overpass. If you're ever going out to Hall Road, yeah. Yeah. and you get to the real sharp overpass with the railroad, you've gone too far. It's that bridge that says, closed, road closed, and it's almost not there anymore. <laughs> Does but the county work with us on that at all? No. 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 City of Buchanan needs City of Buchanan committed to the project. Uh, I just want to ask one question, too. Oh, excuse me. No. Um, are we going to have any kind of identification for the police station? Yeah, that's it. That's in the works. Uh, uh, you know, the rendering showed public safety complex. Right. You know, uh, it also showed a new metal facade with pillars and brickwork and all that. That's not been budgeted. It wasn't in the original design plans. It was a schematic, but it never made it to the finished drawings. And so to say one side's going to say police department, one side's going to say fire department, or does it say public safety complex? I do not know. Uh, the foyer is used by both departments, you know, and it indicates fire department on the left, police department on the right. But as far as outside signage, you know, there was nothing, you know, well, I think it's something we would take on it, I would think. I think we really need to do that. For 32 years, I've had to tell people where our police station is. Yeah. And it's ridiculous. And now you're going to have to start all over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean. Now what you told them isn't true. And that's true. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good point, though, with some identification there. A little blue light on top of it going round and round. Then the fire department will put the bigger red light. Red light. <laughs> and then the police department's going to put the bigger blue light. Okay. <laughs> what else you got for Jack? Anybody else? I got, got another question. Uh, yeah. uh, we discussed some time ago about a handicapped fishing pier down at the boat ramp. Yes. Well, I've, I've been asked again this week about what about the handicap fish, fishing pier? Uh, is there any uh, you know, uh, funds available anywhere for handicapped? Uh, um, that was, I mean, when I first came on board almost three years ago, I mean, that was a project that was on the stove but not on the burner. Yeah. And um, there had been no action because of... Uh, it was going to have to have it what you know that thing we like to use to all of our uh, people wanting to develop in the floodway in H and H study, showing that no rise in the floodplain elevation due to this fishing pier. And then there were locations of where do we want to put it? Did we want to put it at the old boat ramp that's straight off of Camden Avenue, which is what the consensus was, or did we want to put it over behind the soccer fields? On West Virginia West and, you know so it just kind of died you know I I've not heard anything else about it and uh, there was a reason you know Burl had, was looking into it I believe and uh, the project just kind of stopped and but I, I'll, I'll look into it and yeah, see there, what there, there's been an increased uh, interest in it uh, and, and rightly so I think that we should provide something like that yeah uh, and the other thing I wanted to say was that I heard today at noon that uh, 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 Senator Barnes and Carnes are introducing legislation concerning SHPO, but uh, they will have an opportunity uh, to review, but if they do not give decision within 60 or 90 days, then the project goes on anyway. I have not heard that. That, that uh, not that's heard what that. Steve told us today. That we, was, they're trying to get that introduced, so I think that would be a good thing also. So you might talk to Steve Foster about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll look into those <coughs> two items and get back with you hopefully, but I'll also see you before a month's out. But uh, uh, I hope so. you know, before I report to you all again. Any other questions? Sorry it took so long. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Tom wants to wants to try them again. All right. Try <coughs> Tom again. Let's see if I can get back again. <laughs> Council members, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jack. Hello. Hey, Tom. Yes. Can you hear me? You good? I can hear you. All right, you are. Can you hear the mayor? I can hear the mayor. All right, we're good to go then. All right, uh, Dave McCauley. Thank you, Mayor. Several updates. Uh, since the last meeting, there's been additional contact. Actually, uh, Federal Prosecutor Will William Ewenfeld contacted me last Friday, and we spoke by phone for 15 or 20 minutes. 
about what the composition of the new uh, Upshur Lewis or Upshur Lewis and Barber, whatever configuration we end up with, uh, Drug and Violent uh, Crimes Task Force might look like. And he's asked me to take the next uh, week or two and to identify who we believe would be the best uh, persons to comprise that board. Of course, he'll have ultimate uh, thumbs up or thumbs down veto rights as we look at identifying the players. When uh, Michael Doss and Chief Gregory and I attended the meeting back in June in Harrison County, just want to remind the council that they had all of the uh, Harrison County uh, uh, police chiefs from their several cities in Harrison County, various representatives from the sheriff's department. Uh, they had uh, several state police detachment commanders that were part of their force. They had FBI, they had drug enforcement agent, they had the federal marshal's office involved. Uh, so our role will be to identify the obvious players, at least in Upshur and Lewis County. Um, of course, the prosecuting attorneys of each county would be participants in this, the sheriffs. Uh, there's actually two incorporated cities in Lewis County, even though Lewis County is smaller than Upshur. Jane Lou has a, a police force, so they would be invited to participate. So it's, it's a very promising kind of a thing. I further uh, queried Mr. Elenfeld a little bit uh, about, depending upon what the final configuration might prove to be for our uh, area task force, uh, is, is there opportunity to sort of form a consortium of task forces? That is to say, maybe periodic meetings with Harrison County and with our friends to the east in Randolph, Tucker, Pocahontas County, and he said that's precisely what he was planning on trying to accomplish. Uh, that way we could uh, share some further resources, maybe farm some undercover folks out of one task force area into another where uh, the undercover activities would be more discreetly conducted. Uh, some, very, some very cool stuff, I think, coming down the pike with all of that. Um, the last meeting we were talking about the board, utility board members compensation ordinance. And I had uh, suggested that maybe uh, we look at our city employee uh, handbook relative to what could prove to be exceptions for uh, sick leave and bereavement absence, that kind of thing. Um, there is some good language in the employee handbook, uh, but I did note as I was reviewing the latest revisions to that from last year, that uh, our employee handbook, um, as far as benefits, including those sick leave and bereavement policies, applies only to uh, full-time employees. So while language could be borrowed out of that and made applicable to board members, it uh, isn't as a matter of uh, law right now applicable to the board members. So more to follow on that as the council continues to uh, mull that one over. I um, just want to echo what Jay Holland was talking about with the Lumos project a little bit. And one of the reasons uh, I did a fairly lengthy letter uh, about two weeks ago to uh, uh, the Lumos representatives and the Chapman Technical Group representatives, there has been in the works at different stages going back 15 or 20 years plans to develop uh, what is known as Trader's Alley between East Main Street and whatever configuration ultimately was to prevail insofar as Jawbone Park is concerned. There are two utility poles located in close vicinity, just a few feet apart one from the other, that if you extended the 16 foot wide alley straight down from East Main Street into Jawbone, um, right now it is not a straight shot. Uh, there are utility poles in the way, they're going to have to be moved. Um, there are some other, uh, some grading of the alley that would have to ensue. Uh, so the reason that we're being so careful with the Lumos part of this equation, we don't want to give a thumbs up to someone who uh, is going to install yet another utility in that alley and possibly another utility pole or two when we're trying to develop a plan to make that alley more pedestrian friendly and to really clean up from an aesthetic perspective of that area. Uh, so that's, that, that's another part of this project that I think Jay will report about in, in future meetings. 
I'm working with Mr. Ludlow on about three different things, including trying to bring conclusion to the CSX uh, Railroad Property Acquisition. There also are a series of rights of way that I've been assisting uh, Sam with uh, out at the uh, Phillips Dairy Farm area. And Richard Trent, our sort of internal auditor, is actually the trustee for several of the Lorene and Burton Phillips trusts. So uh, all good news coming that way as that sanitary sewer line uh, realizes expansion. Uh, sudden link update, I've had, uh, haven't had another meeting with Peter Brown since the last meeting, but we've had some more email exchange. He's getting more information from his people as to uh, what might be offered in so far as lineup, uh, TV cable lineup additions as part of our package. We were again uh, discussing terms of uh, the lease of the head end on Cemetery Hill. So uh, hopefully by uh, the next meeting or two, I'll have more to report about that. Just a reminder that the uh, five-year franchise term expires with Sudden Link on December 31st. Um, the city and college are working to complete the Learning Trail, which is the next phase of the Buck Cannon River Trail, uh, located in back of the split rail fence operation. Uh, there was a meeting with city and college uh, representatives, uh, West Virginia split rail representatives. There were about 12 or 13 of us all together. It was pretty equal as far as four or five folks from the city, from the college, Jerry Arnold and Lowell Smith and Robbie Barber and myself were there, Barry Pritz, Kathy Gregg, uh, Jeff Wagner, uh, Kenny Andrew from the college, uh, Mark Waldo, who also serves on our Consolidated Public Works Board, was there as the primary representative for West Virginia Split Rail. And uh, there's, there's a little more work that's got to be done down there. We are uh, a surveyor, Dale Bennett, is going to be marking some corners so we'll know exactly where the city alley and street is versus the college and West Virginia Split Rail lines. Uh, Mark Waldo on the spot kindly uh, offered to provide all of the materials necessary to construct a fence that would divide the city leased college owned property from the West Virginia split rail fence property. So that's, that's really a cool thing. And the dedication, tentative as it is, of the new learning trail will be Friday, September 19 at 1.30 p.m. And there's a couple of surprises that I don't want to let out of the bag forthcoming, but uh, it's, I think it's just going to be another uh, terrific uh, next phase of our river trail. Uh, the only other thing that I would mention is, is if I can do a public service announcement plug, the uh, final pool party that UCARE sponsors that the city is a partner with is next Saturday, August 16, uh, out at the uh, Buchanan Upshire Pool at the park. And it's 8 to 11 for all incoming high school students. So that's all I have. Unless you have questions for me, I have other things to offer to you under new business. Any questions for David? Okay, we'll move ahead to consent agenda. Minutes of the regular meeting, July 17th. Billing and wiring permits, payment of the bills, appointment of city personnel, department heads. You have that copy? Okay. And uh, appointment boards and commissions. You have a copy in your uh, packet. Um, there are a couple of differences. That I would point out to you on uh, your second page, first page, Consolidated Public Works Board to your term. Uh, yours probably says <coughs> Richard Clemens recorder and I think we've changed that to city recorder excuse me I, uh, can I just say I'm having a hard time hearing I'll pick it up a little bit for you we're looking at the at, at, at our uh, appointments for the year uh, and our couple of you would have a copy of that in your file Tom you, you'll see it later I'm just telling council that uh, there are some uh, changes to what they have in their packet. Uh, Consolidated Public Works Board is the city recorder rather than Richard Clemens. 
Uh, we have a vacancy in the police civil service. Uh, I have a request here from uh, Robert Osborne to be placed on the planning commission. So I would like to add him there at the first vacant position under planning commission on your second page. Mary's he's actually he's on there. Actually on he's the on there, yeah. okay. Uh, Mary Allball as uh, council, is she on there? Um, yes, page. I am. Still on the next page. Okay. Next page. All right. Maybe maybe these changes did get in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Richard Clemens. Yeah. Teresa wasn't certain. Yeah. And uh, then on the police committee, we have Rick Richard Edwards or Rick Edwards instead of Richard Clemens. Is that corrected on yours last page? Yeah. Oh. Where's the yeah. last last page of your packet? Oh, the police committee. Yeah. yeah, police committee, and and we added an audit committee, and it's there. So uh, I would uh, entertain a motion that we. Uh, Excuse me, there. Yes. Second page. Um, Dorothy Short's still on there for two fourteen to two thousand seventeen. Yes. Is she going to remain on there for that under the zoning board of appeals? Presently. Presently, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Question also about the uh, fire service, civil service terms. Uh, Considering the fiasco that happened this week, where nobody showed up for the uh, well, uh, for for the uh, testing of the uh, physical testing of the con uh, not contestants but the applicants, uh, the applicants, um, I think we should reconsider uh, who is appointed to that. Uh, I understand that Terry Mills finally showed up after he was called. But uh, Mr. Ross or Mr. Parker, neither one showed up for the whole thing. That's rather embarrassing for them to get all this stuff out to do that testing, and then, and then nobody shows up to that uh, has to be there to uh, authorize it. Yeah, I think uh, there were some mistakes made. They're being corrected. And uh, in terms of uh, if you're suggesting any disciplinary action against <coughs> those members, I suggest you read the Fire Civil Service Code before. No, I'm not in disciplinary action. I'm just thinking that. Uh, as they come due, we should replace them. Well, so. you know, may I, Mayor? Yes. I sent as the clerk on that, and I was there, and so was Mr. Mills. Um, everyone was contacted, and everybody was given the times that this that the board was supposed to meet to have the quorum because you can't do the testing without. All right. There were some outstanding circumstances between Mr. Parker and Mr. Ross on certain days and certain times. I would not, um, I, I concur that it was a uh, bad show of support, but at this point I would not suggest that they be taken off until they give, be given the proper time to respond. Uh, we are in communication with them now and will fix this uh, so that it does not happen again, but um, the schedule still does remain that we have the written test in two weeks with those candidates, which does require a quorum, and then we'll do the agility test afterwards. Now, I would also preface that with we had to reschedule the very first of the fire service board meetings, which is kind of what messed up everybody's schedule because it was that uh, major storm that came through, and we had a major emergency, so we couldn't have the firefighters there to help us to do the, the initial agility test. So the, it's, it's extenuating circumstances, circumstances that brought this about that kind of messed up everyone's um, calendar on it. I understand that, but I don't see where the first, uh, having the reschedule for the first time has much to do with the second time, which... Uh, would, well, we've had, why, we've why had to didn't. postpone every two weeks, and that's what's yeah. happened. And I'm, I'm afraid there may have been a miscommunication somewhere along the line on exactly what dates now at this point we're at because of those initial uh, cancellations because technically that last test should have been a written test well it, you know uh, technically everybody has a calendar that they should keep i i would agree with okay. that and it was it was an unfortunate circumstance i was there and um so was mr mills and we did uh profusely apologize to everyone that was there that attended and uh the, the fire chief is aware of it. I've had discussions with him on this and we will fix this problem. Sometimes that happens. It almost happened this afternoon as a matter of fact. So in this case, um, I just wanted to clear that out the record there, put it straight. If you wanted to do 
um, at another date and uh, reappoint other members for that. It's understandable. Well, yeah. I just want to make sure that that's officially out on the record because I do know there was a lot of uh, okay. communication I, I about it. I appreciate your explanation. Uh, my feeling is that, uh, as with most other organizations, if you don't have a quorum, it doesn't affect anyone other than the people that are there at the meeting. Oh, this affected a whole bunch of people, did a whole bunch of work, and, and it was for naught. So uh, I understand that's that. it. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just make one quick comment. The um, I, Kenny, I don't know if you've done this already, but we probably should send a letter of apology to each one of the people that showed up for the, the test. That'd that probably be a good PR thing. Okay. How about a motion for the Dave, can you speak up, please? Dave, Dave always, he's a soft spoken man, you know. I was just saying <laughs> that the mayor ought to send a letter of apology to each one of the candidates that showed up for the uh, physical fitness test and uh, just apologize. Yeah, that's, probably not, that's, that's not a bad idea. I'd like to. Let me know when I get a chance to weigh in on this. I, I just say well, that's already being Mayor, can I say okay. something first? Oh, oh, let's let Tom. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Tom. Tom. Well, the only the only thing I'd offer is that I, you know before we go and sack the the fire or civil service commission, you know we just need to make sure that uh, yeah that they had you know that they have real notice of this and uh, yeah the the fact that that of the three of them none of them showed up. To me, tells me that there's that this is probably more of a breakdown of some system than uh, a conscious choice of you know all three members simultaneously to just neglect their duty. So I, I think we need to do a little bit of information gathering here. Uh, I, my understanding is that this was not a regularly scheduled meeting, uh, but I, I just want to know, and I don't know the answer to this, but how much notice did? these members have prior to this meeting time well we're I'm, I'm pretty sure we're making some corrections on on, on our part and uh, to in an attempt where, to avoid, avoid this right? happening in the future really right now could, could have been a breakdown in communication yes and uh, so where was the breakdown how do we know we don't we don't know yet Tom that's what okay. we're, we're we'll, exploring. we'll get to it it just happened a couple of days ago and, and we yeah, need to right. we need to work it out and uh are any members of the commission present the right now side of it? Uh, not here no okay they might well i think maybe they should be invited to, to do that okay i'll make one other comment mayor okay. um when we make these appointments uh they the the individuals committees that are being compensated will they they know that there's a possibility of a change in process for compensation yeah we're tenancy. reviewing this uh, ordinance that we're proposing uh, with the board members at okay. board meetings All right. so but they, that, they that have apply. reason to be aware. The, the, the civil service board members they, are not compensated. They're no, not I'm, I'm talking about the, right. We're talking about all boards right yeah. now. Yeah. I'm just talking about yeah. the appointed board members yeah. that are compensated. Okay. Mary, you had a statement. Maybe a I, I just want to say that um, earlier I, I uh, was kind of maybe feeling like Ron, but once I've heard the explanation from both the mayor and the city recorder that I understand that these things can happen. I uh, also want to say that the uh, Civil Service Commission for the Fire and Police Department are two of the main, most important boards, I feel, um, because they do what they deal with the hiring and the advancement and whatnot of our police officers and our fire ch firemen. And it's a very... Personal. Wow. Yes. It's, it's, it's a personal thing. So I think that, um, that you guys will work it out. So that's well, all actually, I actually, I haven't heard an explanation yet. I've just heard that there was a problem and it will be taken care of. And, uh, uh, and I've when not we heard an, an, an explanation of what actually happened. So, Mary, uh, there is no explanation. Ron, when know. we have, uh, when, when we get to the bottom of it, we'll let you know. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm not trying to hide so, anything. So no. You really don't know yet. Okay. Don't, don't well, it's only been a couple of days. Yeah, so, so yeah. When, when we get to the bottom of it, we'll let everybody know yeah, yeah. What, what happened. And, if, yeah. you know, and, and Mitch, has, a, Mitch has been. Well, he's been yeah. recovering oh, yeah, he's from surgery too. Right, he's out of commission. <coughs> and, uh, 
So there's a lot if of I, key players in maybe. If I may, um, we have to re-communicate with the, uh, not only the board members, but with the candidates and reschedule this, and it has to be in a letter to them. And within that letter, Dave, I will be putting in a, a, an apology with that. All right. And as we reschedule this, um, we now we understand where we have to have as far as communication goes with them. I don't see this being an issue anymore, but we will find out where the gap broke. It won't happen again. Right. And, yeah. and we'll report. When we find Thank out what the, what the break was, we'll, we'll let everybody know. Thank you much. Did Thanks we, for joining us. Did we get a motion? to approve the list of appointments. I'll make a motion to approve the list of appointments. I have a quick question. There's a letter from the CBB prior to all the appointments and vacancies, and I don't know if that needs to be considered now, but we have um, vacancies on the CBB board. Yeah, oh, council that, appointment for CBB. Oh, can I do that? I want to do it. <laughs> I didn't know that was to be discussed and decided upon tonight. Um, if it's in. Yes. It, it should have been a late addition to the packet. But it would be I saw it. Council does make one appointment to the CVB, and that was John Waltz. There's a city representative, it's and right there's also right. two appointed tourism representatives, which we gave suggestions that the CVB came up with. I mean, council can choose anybody for the tourism representatives, but we right did a little bit of legwork and found some people. I figured it would make it easier. For you, you're looking at it right after the uh, under the consent um, payment of the bills. You should see it behind your payment of the bills. Paper. Oh yeah, there they are. They come from her. They look like this. I'm looking. There. It's right after all the numbers. Well, I shouldn't have to. Maybe that's why you're okay. missing one. Uh, yeah. I had to. Well, you still must up. I did. I would like to say, Mayor, if you don't mind. Speak I'd like up. to volunteer if you'd like for. Uh, well, CDB makes a suggestion of uh, Thomas Andrews from the Daily Grind and. Craig Priest or Upshur County Extension Agent. Right. So do we have two appointments. We have a vacancy, and John Waltz is no longer a council member. Right. So if uh, I had asked uh, for appointment on that a couple of weeks ago, and still would like to consider that. CVB? Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll hold this off and have a discussion on this. We've got a couple council people, one on. We've got a couple others that are being. We'll discuss this a little bit. I would entertain a motion. I have a motion to approve the um, appointments as presented or as amended, and I'd ask for a second. I'll second. second. Motion made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion signify so to say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. No. The ayes have it. With one and one uh, dissenting vote. No. Uh, that was a consent agenda. Yeah. That's what I mean. That's what we already have. Okay, and uh, I jumped correspondence. We have a planning commission report, uh, and we have. Uh, does that come from you, Rick? No, that came from Rich, and it's in your packets. So it's a matter of uh, information. It's in the packet. Right. We also have in the packet a notice of intention application for license to operate ABCA licensed private club from the Convention Business Bureau, and uh, yes. and I think we have to approve that so that it can be sent forward. So I'd entertain a motion to approve the A B can't even spell what I do with A B C A license private club. Is that the one application? I would, uh, I would make a motion, Mr. Mayor, that we approve the uh, a license application for the uh, alcohol beverage control. B C A private club. Uh, I'll second. 
Motion made and seconded. Discussion or question? Yeah, tell me what this. Tell me what the what. Tell, it's tell, a, I'm just having a hard time here. Which, uh, which I'm sorry, Tom. It's a, uh, the the CDB is making an application for an ABC license for the convention center. Oh, I see. Okay. So that's no the, the motion has been made and seconded to approve on the behalf of the city the application, and then they still have to go before the ABC. So, uh, we ready for the question on that? All in favor, yes. signify so by saying aye. 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 The ayes have. Okay. I'll get myself organized here again in a minute. I hope, <laughs> I hope so. I do too. <laughs> There's uh, also a request from uh, Chapel Hill United Methodist Church to uh, uh, barricade Hart Avenue for block party. August 23rd. From where to where? Uh, they'll block it from Kanawha Street to um, Smithfield. Smithy. Yeah. And I entertain a motion. To so moved. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion made. Second. All in favor signify so and saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. I'm going to break my ears. Now. David, uh, back to you on the ordinances thank you mayor i'll try to do this as quickly as possible but th there are two uh, rather detailed involved ordinances the city of buchanan has had zoning since 1973. Uh, as a consequence of the adoption of zoning under the state code uh, the zoning board of appeals and the planning commission were thus created and have continued for the past 41 years now to serve our city very well in 1987 and 88 uh, Rich Clemens and I, we actually started out with a committee, I think, of five people, but it ended up pretty much being Rich Clemens and I. Uh, we did a comprehensive uh, review of the zoning ordinance. Uh, we added at that time a couple of new zones uh, that became effective January 1 of 89. Along about 2000, give or take a year, uh, by uh, ordinance, two new zones were created. The quarter zone along uh, Route 33, and the Memorial Zone, which uh, is largely the Hebner Cemetery. Uh, there have not been any new additions of zones since about 2000. Um, several months ago, the city was broached by Wesleyan College uh, and identified reasons why, and consistent with what is happening in other places, uh, that the college, or that the city create a college zone, which would allow for greater planning and use, land use by Wesleyan. Also, in that period of time, in the last, since January of 2013, um, we annexed about 63 acres, uh, which we think of now as the new armory site. And there was discussion then about the need to establish a zone for military operations. And in previous discussions with former West Virginia Military Council Scott Barnett, we came up with the military district. So you have two ordinances tonight, uh, Ordinance 383, which would create the college district in our zoning ordinance, and Ordinance 384, which would create the military district. Ten days ago, the Planning Commission met after the City Council referred these matters to them and unanimously endorsed the creation of these two new zones. Uh, I had draft ordinances that uh, was shared with the Planning Commission that night and subject to a couple of tweaks in each ordinance, uh, that same ordinance which was uh, recommended to the council to be approved is now before you this evening. So if I can, I'll, I'll get ordinance 383 out there and, and 384 after it. This would be ordinance number 383 of the city of Buchanan, an ordinance amending zoning ordinance number 244 of the city of Buchanan, by one, establishing a new zoning district hereafter to be known and referred to as College District, and two, rezoning the real estate comprising the campus of West Virginia Wesleyan College from R2 Residential District to, to College District. Where, and let me just go through the whereas real quickly. Whereas the city of Buchanan first adopted comprehensive zoning in 1973, pursuant to ordinance number 166, and whereas West Virginia Wesleyan College, sometimes here and after referred to as Wesleyan, <coughs> or the college, was founded in 1890, and has been an integral part of the Buchanan community and landscape for approximately 125 years, and 
Whereas Wesleyan is a residential campus that largely has existed as an autonomous community within the greater Buchanan community by exercising a combination of educational, residential, commercial, industrial, athletic, and recreational functions, and whereas the notwithstanding Wesleyan being grandfathered in many respects from zoning regulations, there are nevertheless a number of city zoning applications that impede the college's administration from being able to engage in long-term institutional land use planning and fuller campus development, and whereas the Planning Commission of the City of Buchanan specifically recommended to the City Council that a new college zoning district be established during its meeting on July 28, 2014, to empower college officials to better utilize Westland's real estate holdings, and whereas the Council believes it is reasonable and appropriate to ease certain zoning applications in order to expand the college's opportunity to plan and develop its campus, thus advancing Wesleyan's growth and flourishing, and in so doing, benefiting the greater Buchanan community. <clears throat> and whereas the current zoning of the Wesleyan campus proper holdings as R2, General Residential District A, is not an appropriate zoning designation, for the many uses and non-residential activities occurring upon the campus of the college, and finally, whereas, the Council of the City of Buchanan now deems it to be reasonable and appropriate to adopt all of the foregoing recommendations of the Planning Commission as are set forth within the Commission's report emanating from the July 28 meeting and further within the geographical area as is depicted and set forth upon the attached map and to formally establish the college zoning district now therefore be it ordained and enacted by the council of the city of buchanan as follows there's a couple of very specific findings article two sets forth the general description uh, of the what would be the college zone and there is reference at the throughout this ordinance to a map which would become part of this uh, new zone and part of our comprehensive zoning ordinance it's a pretty lickety split laid out. Um, the best way, in particular, as I try to describe it to our colleague, Tom O'Neill, if you go down to the intersection of College Avenue and Mead Street, and you go down the road from Mead Street, essentially, into the Buchanan River, all of that to the north of that, to the Buchanan River down by the West Virginia split rail fence property, would all be in the college zone. Um, the original campus proper that was acquired in 1889 consisted of what is pretty much a 40 acre square. The campus is now estimated to be just a little bit more than 125 acres. Since 1973, when the city adopted zoning, about half of that additional 83 acres has been acquired all of that property in 1973, including the original campus proper, was zoned as R2. The campus proper, the 40-acre area, was grandfathered. So if the college wanted to do whatever on that 40-acre campus proper, they could do that. This other 80-some acres that has been acquired, most of it, since 1973, is still zoned R2. One of the examples that I gave at the Planning Commission meeting last excuse me, last November there was a near catastrophic sanitary sewer failure that resulted in city crews working nonstop for weeks uh, in that neck of the woods and the back edge of two of the tennis courts, two of the eight college tennis courts, ended up collapsing into part of the hole that was created from the sanitary sewer, sewer failure. In the months since then, the college has looked at relocating its tennis courts. Not only that, but the track and the football field have been expanded, and it's gonna be necessary for the physical plant folks to relocate the uh, tennis courts. A couple of the areas that have been looked at are down near the Brook Street pump station site, where the college has now acquired all of the property, and another area is down close to the river trail along Wood Street. All of that property is zoned R2. Technically, tennis courts would not be permitted in R2. That is a residential district, and this is an athletic recreational endeavor. That is one of many examples that could be cited 
that technically limit the college's ability to best use its real estate. So this plan would allow the college to do more things with its 125 acres. Now a couple of concerns were raised by the Planning Commission. One of the provisions of this ordinance is going to require the college to do a number of things. Every year, there will, the college will be required to file an annual report. And if you go with me to, let's see here, Article 5, Miscellaneous Provisions. Let me just read it real quickly. The college shall by the end of each calendar year file with the city administrator and city zoning and, house, and housing enforcement officer, which then shall be promptly shared with the city's planning commission, a written report to assist the city's comprehensive plan development, which report shall at a minimum provide the following information. I want to reiterate that word, to facilitate the city's comprehensive plan development, okay? So this is what would be contained in this, uh, the kinds of things that would be set out in this annual college report uh, sent to the city. One, identification of all real estate situated within the college district acquired by the college since the filing of the previous year's report. Let's say that the college, for whatever reason, acquired all the property between Mead Street and Florida Street in the next year. Well, it might make sense for the city to look at that and say, well, gee, that college zone should be expanded. We should refer this back to the Planning Commission for further evaluation. And no, that's not going to happen, but it's an example of what could happen in the years to come. The college does intend to expand its campus further. Two, identification of all new construction projects within the college district anticipated to be commenced in the year following the report's filing. Three, identification of all existing buildings and structures targeted for raising within the college district in the year following the report's filing. Four, update concerning campus matters impacting upon such matters as parking, <coughs> vehicular traffic flow, sidewalk improvements and development, and signage. Five, identification of any project pursuant to which the college may be seeking municipal bond assistance in the year following the report's filing. The reason why that element is very critical, there is not unlimited bonding opportunities by the city. Uh, if somebody came to the city buck in and I said, we got a $50 million uh, municipal bond deal we'd like to do, this city does not have that bonding capability. So if there was going to be something on down the works that was going to perhaps max out whatever that magical formula is with the amount of bonds that can be issued insofar as municipal bonds, this allows the city to know about it well in advance so that plans can be made uh, to try to uh, satisfy the college, but at the same time, if the city can't do it, then the college would know well in advance that the city is saying, no, we can't do it. And then six, the college annual report shall be shared liberally by the city administrator and city zoning and housing enforcement officer with city utility board and other administrative personnel whose activities would be impacted by college-related projects. The other concern uh, which the Planning Commission had was what about in these areas where the college zone is going to butt up against other residentially zoned uh, property. And I have added a section that Mr. Clemens alluded to during the Planning Commission meeting that is essentially what happens right now in our zoning ordinance when a commercial zone butts up against a residential district. Understand that these lines of demarcation throughout the city are often along an alleyway or a specific street, that kind of thing. And that's mostly the case with the new college zone too. But especially along, if you look on the southern side of the 40-acre campus proper, there are 20 or 25 lots there that the college largely owns that butts up against our, the R2 uh, district. So what the Planning Commission asked was that there be a buffer created in those situations where the college zone immediately abutted the R2 general residential district <coughs> head. The language that I created uh, that Mr. Clemens approved and cited actually in another part of our ordinance. Notwithstanding the general elimination of setback requirements, 
that is minimum front yard, side yard, and rear yard requirements within the college district, when the college district immediately abuts any property zoned as R2, General Residential District A, then in such instances, there shall be a 25 feet buffer with, within which buffer the college shall not improve the property except in such instances where the improvement already exists at the time of the adoption of this ordinance, in which case the college improvement or replacement of the college improvement may remain or otherwise be constructed. The restriction on improvements, this is to clarify what we mean by improvements, <coughs> Uh, excuse me, <clears throat> the restriction on improvements within the buffer shall not include or be deemed to limit the college from creating or installing sidewalks, driveways, parking lots, landscaping, fences, utility lines, and conduit, or lighting within any such buffer area. But it would constrict, very much restrict, the erection of buildings in that 25-foot buffer. So I think we have uh, created what the Planning Commission wanted that was one of their two recommendations that and that the Planning Commission also received the annual college report so that's it on first reading this thing has been in the works for uh, many months I've uh, liberally shared it with city and college officials and waited in some instances uh, for weeks for people to weigh in and read it and give thumbs up on it and now we've fine-tuned it a little bit uh, even more from the Planning Commission meeting. It's my recommendation that the Council consider on the first of two read readings, Ordinance 383 of the City of Buckingham. I have a question, please, Mr. McCauley. Uh, I'll try. Uh, as I ask at the Planning Commission meeting, uh, property that's on the opposite side of the college on Mead Street, uh, all those properties are not currently owned by the college. That's correct. There okay. are there are there are give or take in this 120 120 130 acre college zone maybe four or five acres of property that the college right now does not own and and some of those are along right. Mead Street and if I were one of the property owners there and decided not to sell to the college uh -huh. but I'm already in the zone that I am pretty well unrestricted as to what I can do with my property as long as it stays within what the college zone says. That and as long as you comply with the other sections that the college zone is still subject yeah. to, like the floodplain ordinance, like if it's a commercial situation, having uh, adequate parking, those kinds of things, yes. I, I can, I can turn my property into a parking lot in R2, I can turn it into whatever I want. Not in R2, to. but in the college. In the college zone. Yes, sir. But, but it's still technically R2 because it hasn't been sold to the college, right? The college does not have to own the property for the property to be in this college zone. Okay. There, there are, there are little, there's a, let me let me better illustrate it. There's yeah, another map. map to the map. Okay. There's another map here that shows it's a colorized map that Susan mm -hmm. Ford has helped me prepare. And there goes that one. Uh, so um, we don't need that map anymore. Anyway, these little yellow spots yep. are roughly fifth of an acre parcels. All right. So there's one down here. Here's two that are right beside each other. Actually, the college, a little bit the college has some purchase rights relative to some of these, but I don't want to get into all those particulars. Yeah. You, you see the idea. Over here on Mead Street, you see this, this portion of this Mead Street block. Uh, there are three or four lots there the college does not own right now. Over here is one. Uh, down here, the college owns most things, but there it is within this on Baxter Street, right across from the old Semple School, mm -hmm. Carolyn Dees has a house. Uh, Kevin Johnston sold his house and extra lot to another fella, I can't think of his name, with the Wesleyan Physical Plant, but yeah, you get the idea. There are, there are pockets of property in the college zone that are not, right now at this moment, owned by the college. By Wesleyan. Uh, how many colleges, how many cities in West Virginia have college zones? I think this, I think other than WVU, I think this is the second instance. The second instance. I don't know about Marshall. I'm not sure about Marshall University. Yeah. Um, no, no other prior problem. 
not, not that I'm aware of. Across the country, there are many of them. But in West Virginia, did you name some? Uh, Duke, North Carolina State, University of North Carolina. So they're all public institutions. Uh, oftentimes, but there's there's many there's many private ones too that I stole language out of as we developed this ordinance. David, do I have time to ask some questions or not? Yeah. Um, David, who who from the college was the impetus as far as asking for a college zone? Barry Prince. Barry Prince. Yes. Um, he I appeared got, before this council several months ago right. and specifically made that request. What what can't be done currently if we don't provide a college zone? There's not a time sensitivity to this issue. Is there? Well. As I, the one example that I gave just a, a few minutes ago was you can't put a tennis court in what is presently zoned R2. But they can go to the zoning board and ask for an exception? No, they cannot. They cannot do it. The zoning board of appeals can grant variances relative to dimensional facets, but is restricted and prohibited under state code from expanding uses set forth by the comprehensive zoning ordinance. So if the college wanted to build, say, a building that's 10 stories high and the current zoning ordinance might limit that to five or six stories the zoning board of appeals could expand that or if the college uh, in its r2 district <coughs> wanted to do away with a backyard requirement on several lots maybe they're going to build another new dorm the zoning board of appeals could grant that variance those kinds of things dimensional things they want to put a sign up that's bigger than what is otherwise permitted in R2. Uh, that's another example of a variance. But when it comes to uses, uh, only the Planning Commission, subject to the Council's action, can expand the uses. And that's what the purpose of this ordinance is, as well as Ordinance 384 that you're going to take up next. But to the Council, um segment as you're saying only the council can make the exception could we do that as a piecemeal operation rather than a whole shot with a college in? can that be done an ordinance for every lot i don't know i mean i'm i, I have I, i'll have to i'll have to make an observation david i don't mean to offend you when i say this the um, one of the issues i've had for a long time is Tom? Can you hear me? Tom's gone. Oh, he is. Okay. He, can't hear he gave up. Um, <laughs> one of the issues I have, David, if, if we adopt something like this, and maybe we should. I don't know yet. I want to think about it a little bit more. But the I think we need to have an independent outside council uh, reviewing the ordinance. And the reason why I'm saying that is you probably know what I'm going to say is the general counsel for the college in the city attorney i think we need an independent outside review also uh, from an attorney standpoint um, i think that would be healthy for us and it also be healthy for you quite frankly i think you're in a position where i think in most cases you admirably have negotiated the waters of being the general counsel for the college and the city attorney i think that's a tough thing to do sometimes but i think you've done an admirable job with that but I think particularly with an ordinance like this, it's something that we as elected officials and you as city attorney, we need to be aware of. Um, so I, I'm not the prepared to vote yes or no now. I'd rather table it. I also think I'd like to have Mr. Pritz, Dr. Pritz come and really give us what are the advantages and disadvantages of not doing this. What kind of impact we'll have with the, uh, because it's college zone, uh, I know they're exempt from B&O tax, but if they decide to put a for-profit, you know, like a Subway or a McDonald's era franchise, are they exempted from the B&O tax because they're in the college zone? No, the okay. operation is not exempt from okay. B&O. Yeah. 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 But, 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 but you're, you're saying where I'm coming from. Sure. I think we need to be, you know, if, if it's... I was worried that maybe there's a big college grant out there from somebody that we need to get a college zone right away, but I think it's something we need to spend a little bit more time on, and I have some other questions well, I might want to ask. Well, they are, as, as you're aware, they're doing a 
great deal of work there on the new uh, stadium facility. Yes. And uh, part of that process, I'd drive by there on occasion and have a look to see how they're coming because uh, they, they won't do it right if I don't watch. But uh, <laughs> they, uh, uh, I noticed a dozer pushing dirt over the bank toward the tennis courts. I think their history yeah, I very agree. soon. Yeah. And uh, is that a fall sport? It's both fall and spring. Fall and spring. And men's so they're going to want to build tennis courts they're not someplace. Gonna be, they're not going to be able to do it this fall. And, well, if we don't give them this ordinance, they're not going to be able to. Well, as I, said, I don't see the harm in, in uh, this is a two reading ordinance. I personally do not see any harm in passing this on first reading. That gives us a couple of weeks to mull it over and chew on it, but it keeps the ball rolling. And, uh, and I would ask that Dr. Prince come. Yeah. Maybe President Bob they can explain better. Yeah. Uh, so they, some they of could, the they limitations. Have here at next meeting. Sure. And, uh, and, I, and I want to say very quickly that, you know, I, I'm not against the college i mean please don't misread what i'm saying but i mean the college is a wonderful asset to the community a great resource to the community um, i purchased when i was at the college many of those pieces of property david that you have indicated on the on the area and, and, and you know stanley martin had a wonderful long-term view of what the uh, the college uh, should look like at some point in time when he finish constructing the, uh, the chapel and so forth. I, I hope someday um, the, the split rail fence, that property could be moved out to another area that would be more compatible for that kind of operation. And that would be in recreational fields and park and so forth. So I don't, I don't want to give the appearance I'm, I'm against this, but I'm not comfortable with it right now. There's one, there's one section of the ordinance that I didn't read, that I did read to the Planning Commission. Okay. Maybe, maybe it would be helpful. I don't want to leave the impression that as a result of this college zone, that the college can do anything it wants within the college zone. There are 12 very specific things that are permitted within the college zone. One, the conducting of any and all higher educationally related uses, including but not limited to instructional facilities, such as classrooms, laboratories, meeting and conference rooms, faculty and administrative offices, libraries, and audio and video media centers. Two, any and all residential facilities typically associated with college student and or faculty housing, including but not limited to dormitories, lounges, apartment complexes, and fraternity, sorority, and other dwelling houses, but not including mobile homes. Just in the last 10 years, we've removed about 15 trailers. The college has removed 15 trailers down there in that area. Three, any and all facilities for serving meals and beverages, primarily but not exclusively to members of the campus community, and including but not limited to cafeterias, restaurants, cafes, coffee shops, bakeries, and ice cream and yogurt parlors. They already have all of those things. Four, any and all indoor or outdoor facilities for athletic, sporting, training, or recreational purposes, including but not limited to fields, courts, tracks, trails, gymnasiums, exercise complexes, and swimming pools, and also specifically including the City of Buchanan's Riverwalk Trail and the Buchanan River Boat Ramp. Five, any and all indoor or outdoor facilities associated with the performing arts or aesthetic entertainment, including but not limited to musical, theatrical, dance, and cinematic productions or exhibitions. Six, any and all retail establishments typically associated with college functions including the sale of books, apparel, groceries, and sundries. Seven, any and all facilities associated with the conducting of meetings and conferences. Eight, any and all facilities associated with the delivery of technology, data, telephony, television, and radio, including but not limited to towers, poles, conduit, and coaxial or fiber optic lines, whether installed above or below ground. Nine, any and all facilities associated with human, medical, or wellness care as administered by physicians, nurses, counselors, trainers, etc., for the benefit of any campus community member, whomsoever. 10. Any and all facilities associated with the college's physical plan activities, including but not limited to building and structure improvement and maintenance, 
such as landscaping, carpentry, painting, plumbing, masonry, mechanical and electrical work, and the storage and warehousing of all reasonable or necessary vehicles, machinery, equipment, tools, materials, and any and all other personal property. 11. Any and all miscellaneous offices and facilities, including but not limited to the campus post office, the service center for document assembly and photocopying, laundry services, and the campus security office. And 12. Any and all parking lots, provided that the surface is improved with asphalt, concrete, or compacted gravel, and satisfies both ADA requirements and any city stormwater drainage requirements. Um, as for me and questionable objectivity as I drafted this ordinance as neutrally as I could for the benefit of the city and the college, uh, this ordinance was liberally shared with Mr. Clemens, Mr. Doss, and the Planning Commission 10 days ago unanimously recommended that the council adopt this ordinance. So, is it a perfect ordinance? Probably none of the 167 ordinances that I've done the last 32 years are perfect, but, but I try to at least make them all legally sufficient. Would it, would it be a good summarization to say that this would be a college zone within the city limits? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, I think that... Yeah. Is Mr. What was his name? Um, Gary Fritz. 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 He, Fritz. He referred to it as a, a, city. a, a little small city many, within a city. Any city within a city. Yeah. Right. And, and they are that over there. Pam? Um, how's this going to affect the residents that have property in that thing, in that area? They, they, they it won't, it, it will is expand. It change, is it going to change their tax? No. 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 That, it, it won't bother them tax-wise? No. Um, no. Would it, would it, would it affect them if they wanted to sell their property? Nothing that the city of Buchanan can do can change the assessment of real oh, estate. Right. Only the assessor can do that. That's a that's a that's a state and county function. It doesn't have anything but to do. The assessor with doesn't city. have a college zone assessment, and so if you're not in R two, and you're in the college zone, if I put a house in the middle of a 500 acre farm. It's going to be zoned. It's going to be assessed as Class Two property. If I build a skyscraper and put a bunch of business folks in the middle of that five-acre farm, that's going to be a different classification. I'm going to pay more taxes. Doesn't matter how it's zoned, because okay. the fact of the matter is, is 90% of the state of West Virginia isn't covered by zoning, because few counties have county-wide zoning, and unless you're in a municipality, zoning doesn't apply. Well, so the reality is, I think that the properties that are within the college zone that are not part of the college, actually their value may be enhanced in some Absolutely. ways. Well, that, that, was, that was my question. The college, the college is going to want to purchase it, quite frankly. Am I? Uh, if, if the opportunity to use your property for more things is expanded, that's not to say somebody's got a nice house down there is going to tear their house down right. on a fifth acre lot and try to build a McDonald's. I mean, you, you can't do that as a practical matter. So, I mean, a lot of this is just practicality. Um, there really is, other than current uses for these little yellow places that you see here and there on the checkerboard, it's really, as a practical matter, not as a legal matter, it's gonna, it would be difficult for those folks to develop their property for something that would not be in keeping with the college zone. And, and these people are all have been made aware that, that, that we're <coughs> That we as a city, they will be. Oh, they will. They oh, they will. Yeah, because so they the notice have, yeah. hasn't been published, but it will be after a first reading. Um, David, I'm not questioning your objectivity. I want you to understand that. I just think that's important to point out that you know you're wearing, in some ways, two hats in respect to this. I, I do, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, I, you know, I've been involved with the city and the college. I've been here 30 years. It's hard to believe that. But I think the college is a wonderful asset and resource, and the city is a wonderful asset and resource. And we have done a lot over the years, whether it's the period lighting at the college and the period lighting down here on Main Street. Um, I wish actually the college would even engage more with the city and vice versa in the yes. planning for the future. I think that's really important. And I have a lot of different ideas that I'd like to float out there occasionally. I'm, I'm going to call Dr. Pritz next week and talk about this a little bit more with him, David. But, you know, 
again, if it's not taught, we're not going to build tennis courts this fall anyway. It's not going to happen. But I'm willing to vote yes on it today, but I might reserve based on conversations that I have in the next several weeks. Um, I I'm, I'm, used to be active in the Kubo, uh, which is a national association for university and college business officers. And I like to call them and see how many private colleges that have the demographics of Buchanan and Westland have gone this direction. And as you indicated, you thought there was quite a few. I'd like to, to find out how many and talk to their CFOs if possible and the mayors and see what the upside is. It, it sounds like it's more upside than any kind of downside. So, is so that my impression? Am I reading that right, David, or not? I, I think it's totally an upside. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the trend relative to uh, campuses in, the, in this vicinity of 125 acres to allow greater opportunity for development within that college-owned turf. Yeah, they, won't affect, they won't affect the contractors B and O or anything like that. They no, they still have to pay that. And there's okay. a provision in the ordinance that uh, B and O taxes must be paid. And you know, Mr. Doss is, you know, counting on this next year of millions of dollars worth of physical plant activities. He's already counting those chickens before they're even hatched. I've heard him say, "Oh, gee, I love." seeing the college do work over there yeah, like because it, yeah. we're going to have a good payday at City Hall. Would, right. If you don't mind, I would reiterate that as the recorder or the record keeper for that planning commission, Mr. McCauley has fulfilled his obligation as far as the planning commission that he has to vote. That if he did the changes that he has done within this ordinance, then it was unanimous that the planning commission, and we're the ones that ideally have already thought and discussed a lot of this, uh, voted in favor of this. So I just want to make sure that we all understand that. But the real objection I had, and I'm not on the planning commission, but it, it was very well thought of, thought out, and that was the buffer zone. Uh, yeah. Another question, if, if they wanted, hypothetically, they could build a hotel in the middle of this complex. Uh, I'm thinking specifically because Penn State has a really nice hotel on its property that the college gets all the revenue from. Uh, they could build a hotel on this property that the college could very well utilize and get the revenue from because you know the hotels around the area get really booked up at certain times. That could also be utilized to benefit the community. Uh, that's just hypothetical. That's something they could do on this college zone, right? I am not a CPA and I am not an auditor, but I can tell you that periodically Westland is subjected to an internal revenue service audit to assure that they are within 501c yeah. compliance. That is to say, the college couldn't go up and buy the Meadowbrook Mall and uh, realize those profits and have stockholders and pet it. The college is formed as an educational nonprofit right. corporation. Anything that they make through anything that they do must be under federal law reinvested back into college related academic related functions so you know that, 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 just want to clarify that yeah, although, although david there was a law in 1985 that allowed 501c3s to set up for profit uh, centers within their 501c3 and they had to pay regular federal taxes that's right yeah. they weren't right. they weren't exempt that's, from that's that exactly right. that's um, exactly right and, and, if you, and if you recall we had an issue years ago uh, where the college along with their private college was being charged property taxes for the rentals yeah. and we we maintained that they were part of our endowment fund which i think was correct and the state treasurer uh, gave us a you know he agreed with that if you remember that I took that case before the West Virginia Supreme Court of yeah. Appeals and it is still cited by every college in this state yeah. as the law of our state that colleges don't pay real estate taxes that's right mr. Thomas you're exactly correct I understand. they've never done that huh? that's right <laughs> I've entertained most of the proof yeah. 383 so then, on first reading uh, I'll second that motion made and second it I hope there's no further discussion if there is <laughs> well it's a good discussion though I well I think it is too but uh, I think I will say what no discussion the horse is getting tired but one point is that this protects the people that are moving into the area much the same as the people that move into an airport area right they know the zones there 
They have no excuse if there's parties and they say, but we didn't know that. Right. It protects the pre the people. Right. I think so too. I'll call for the question. All in favor signify so saying aye. 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 Opposed no. The ayes have it's unanimous. Tim, Jared. Thank you. Congratulations, Jared. We should give we should give Tim and his wife a special recognition for three kids. <laughs> triplets. All three, at the same time. Three triplets. Do you need a motion? You may, you may need a scar. You may need a scholarship, Tim. What the heck? Ordinance number three four, City of Arkansas. Yeah, my next time. Uh, this one's a little bit different. And this one is very time sensitive. Yes. Um Oh, I know. Sometime after the 1st of October, is Laura still here? No, she took off. <laughs> she can't blame her. I'd like to take off, too. <laughs> <laughs>
improvised military vehicles, you all military service folks will know these terms way better than me, military engineering vehicles, military light utility vehicles, military recovery vehicles, reconnaissance vehicles, military trailers, and tanks. Three, any and all military residential facilities typically associated with armory operations, including but not limited to a military barracks or dormitory. Four, any and all other ancillary uses permitted by the military, by the military regulating agencies of either the United States of America or the state of West Virginia or traditional to military functions or operations. Five, any and all facilities for operating a conference center open to the public for meetings and receptions, including but not limited to the preparation and serving of meals and beverages, including alcoholic beverages, and outdoor facilities for any and all athletic and recreational purposes. Six, any and all facilities associated with the delivery of technology, data, telephony, television and radio, including but not limited to towers, poles, conduit, and coaxial or fiber optic lines, whether installed above or below ground, and seven, any and all parking lots. If you look further into the ordinance, um, under the next article, Article 4C, this question was raised about the college zone. Mr. Thomas, I can't remember if you were treasurer at the college when the Intellos Tower was erected or not, but the original plan called for about a 200-foot tower to be installed, and we ended up with about a 180-foot tower because the Federal Aeronautics Administration weighed in and said this was on the cusp of being too tall for the approach to the airport, so the tower was reduced by 20 feet. The same restriction would apply to the military zone, and naturally the state and U.S. military would want to comply with FAA requirements, so even that is protected in here. Uh, this is a little bit shorter of an ordinance than, ordinance than the previous one. I think, as a practical matter, notwithstanding the state law, the city of Buchanan would be hard pressed to tell the federal and state militaries that uh, we're, gonna, we're not gonna let you do certain things within your armory. I mean, good luck with that. Both, both um, these ordinances require public notice and public It does. Notice. There will be t t separate public notices for both of these ordinances. Um, class two ads that will start to run next week. And then you'd have a public hearing on each ordinance okay. at the beginning of the August 21st meeting. And, and may I ask a question? Sure. Um, in that, on page four, section A, um, what, what about gas tanks, underground gas tanks, fuel tanks, anything like that? Should that be included or is that exempt? Or they? It's going to be up to the military to They can deal do pretty much whatever they want. You might want to add that in there because maybe they might have something like that. Well, the way our zoning ordinance is right now throughout the city, there are references to state and federal law that we don't legislate that, that you've got to meet those state and federal requirements. Ah. We're hands off. And what, what I have said in here is, look, notwithstanding you oh, being able to do okay. whatever you want to, okay. you're still subject to certain things to the other. like EPA underground storage tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't trump the oh, yeah. We don't trump them? No. I'm ready. I, I would move that we approve the first reading. I got a question. Mr. McCauley, at the Planning Commission, there was a discussion about the extra 14 acres, you know, the initial uh, recreational. Yeah. yeah. Um, the National Guard Park. Well, it says... Uh, the adjoining. Did we address uh, that as far as... Under, under those uses that I read, the phrase was added after the conference center in, uh, and outdoor facilities for any and all athletic and recreational purposes, which is what we had discussed. Mayor, can I ask a quick, quick question? Yep. Um, being the military zone, being former military and having a conference center, is there going to be any issues with, can I bring a gun to the conference center? Since military is going to have weapons there, can I bring a rifle to a wedding? I mean, is that is that anything that needs to be addressed? We, we, we are prohibited by state law from addressing anything concerning firearms. Passed in the last legislature, the cities cannot, cannot do anything about firearms. If the state chooses or the federal government, that's different. But we can't, we can't touch it. They took our voice to put you up on your current issues. Better well. sometimes. Uh, uh, Mayor, there's a heat. Uh, 
We had a motion. Second. And a second. Further discussion? All in favor signify something saying aye. 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 Opposed no. Ayes have it. Thank you, David. I just want to say one thing that Ron and I were present with Rick at the planning commission meeting. And uh, and yes, everything, every, all the questions that I had, you covered them. Um, and we'll talk about that again later on when we get to the second reading. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. brings us to comments and announcements. Uh, remember, everybody. School starts next week. That was uh -huh. mine. <laughs> On Wednesday. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, I've lived in the school system for a long time. Uh, I tell my grandkids it took me till I was 55 to get out of school. And uh, the, uh, uh, but but uh, kids are going to be out and about. The buses are going to be running. And uh, heads up. Mary, you're no, first. Ditto. 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 Have a good evening. <laughs> okay. That it? That it? That it? That's it for me. That it, Mary? That's it, sir. Pam? Have nothing. Come on down the list. Rick? I'm good. Nothing. Tom? Left? Ron? I'd just like to say one thing, and that's the fact that we have uh, our Rock Cave Fire Department now has up and operating a uh, scanner that they have purchased that collects all the different uh, emergency agencies in the county ems fire departments local city police sheriff's department state police uh, and you can get that on your cell phone applications with uh, with an application called 50 uh, 50 radio pro 50 radio, 50 radio pro if, uh, and, and you can hear they get priority to the fire calls. Uh, they are prioritized. If somebody else is on there and a fire call comes in, uh, they take priority. They did this for a couple of reasons. One being that in the southern end of the county, they have a real difficulty communicating and hearing uh, uh, the radio signals, but they do have great cell phone coverage. And now they will be able to hear with probably a 10 to 20 second delay uh, all of this. And it's on a national basis. 50 Pro Radio has emergency uh, frequencies being broadcast like a scanner from all over the world, <laughs> and, and it's uh, it's interesting to listen to. You can listen to Chicago if you want to. Shoot, I have. And you can get with them after this meeting and tell them all about it. I could, and, and uh, but this is for the general public. Oh. Okay. Them too. Uh, yeah, and, and let the general public know because we currently have about seven people listening to this, but. I have one at home on, uh, that has Lewis County. I have my uh, <laughs> my computer set to uh, Harrison County. I have my phone set to Upshur County. You can hear it all. And last night was really interesting. So uh, good. It's good. David. Well, you know I'm going to have to say something. <laughs> He's got <laughs> the, the smirk. The I, I would just again. Um, we need to take a look at the B&O tax and the fire fee and the police fee. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important for our residents to, we need some revisions, I believe, that would be positive for us long term and would help the residents out also. So I get asked, Kenny, that we need to do that in the next, you know, at least month to two months. It's something that I think needs to be done. So. Maybe we should put it on the agenda. No, I, I, We'll, yeah, we, we need to work. We need to discuss things uh, in a workshop or what have you. Uh, that's all I had to say. Have a nice weekend, everybody. And thank you, David, for your thoroughness. Yeah, Festival Fridays. Thank you for your thoroughness on both those ordinances. And uh, I didn't, I wasn't implying that you're not being objective. I'm not apologizing, David. I'm not apologizing. Hell no. <laughs> okay, I would entertain motion to enter an executive session so 698 for second, property. Second. Motion made and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. That means all the rest of you get to go home. <laughs> <laughs>